Hello, this lecture is on the early Canadian Native people. Fully understanding Native life before the arrival of Europeans is not an easy task due to the limitations of sources. However, there have, has been impressive work by scholars that reveals fascinating facts on the diversity and culture of Canadian Natives. The arrival of Europeans ex exposed that in some important ways, Native groups were not too different from Europeans. For example, Native people were no less violent than Europeans. Tribal wars and Natives enslaving other Natives demonstrated the universality of human depravity. There is no consensus among historians of the proper name for the First Peoples of Canada. American scholars usually refer to their Indigenous peoples as Native Americans or Indians. In Canadian history textbooks, historians use a range of names, the First Peoples, First Nations, Aboriginals, Indigenous people, Amerindians, and Indians. Historic documents of British North America and Canada use the term Indian. There is the Indian Act established during the government of Liberal Prime Minister Alexander Mackenzie, but still to this day mostly governs Indigenous affairs. In 1966, the Liberal government of Prime Minister Lester Pearson established the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Recently, Justin Trudeau's Liberal government changed the name to the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada. The Indians were the first immigrants to the New World, wandering across Asia and then migrating across a land bridge linking Siberia and Alaska. These immigration waves took place thousands of years ago. Before the arrival of Europeans, there were no set political boundaries in North America. Wars and conflicts between native groups meant shifting populations as stronger tribes forced weaker tribes to move. Of course, some movement of native groups was due to the availability of game for food. It has been estimated that the, that the land of today's United States and Canada consisted of a population of about 10 million native people before the arrival of 16th century Europeans. Canada was the least populated of the two. Scholars estimate, estimate the population between 200,000 and 500,000. Half of the Canadian na natives lived on the Pacific coast, which offered a steady supply of good food that other regions did not have. Still, life everywhere was primitive and life expectancy was in the range of 25 to 30 years. Reaching a comprehensive understanding of early native life is not realistic. The oral, oral stories of natives offer information on native history, traditions, and values, but these stories leave major information gaps. Archaeology provides facts on populations, settlements, and material culture, but such research does not reveal much about Indian perceptions and feelings. Historians, anthropologists, and other scholars have taken the observations of early Europeans who encountered natives and extrapolated from these writings how life was before the arrival of Europeans. But the European record, record will always have biases. In their discovery that Indians had not invented the wheel and that they had a stone bone based technology, Europeans may have underestimated the other skills that the natives possess. As good as the accumulation of different approaches can be, there will always be some uncertainty on how natives fared before the arrival of Europeans. There is a diversity of traditions and languages among Native people, and one helpful classification is based on cultural areas. The cultural areas in what is today Canadian political border are 
Arctic, Subarctic, Northwest Coast, Plateau, Plains, and Northeast. The Arctic is the northern region above the tree line, which has one of the harshest climates in the world. There were only four months in the year when it was not totally snow covered. The Inuit groups who lived there spoke related languages. In fact, their languages shared similarities with people of northeastern Siberia. People lived in snow houses, used soap stone lamps, and traveled by dog sled. With their stone bone technology, the people fashioned barbed stone spears to fish and hunt birds. Their other sources of meat were sea mammals and caribou, brought down by har harpoons and bow and arrows. The population of the Inuit people was small. The subarctic region below the Arctic is the low-lying region covered with cone-bearing trees. There were long and harsh winters, but forest cover provided shelter. The Diné and Algonquians were subarctic people who lived in communal encampments, numbering about 100 men, women, and children. The key sources of meat were fish, caribou, and moose. There was a thin distribution of, an of game animals in the vast boreal forest, and thus the population was also sparse to the point of being among the lowest density in the world. The Northwest Coast Indians near, near the bounty of the sea had greater resources than inland natives. With the abundance of fish and sea mammals, people did not have to travel far for food. All year long, they lived in villages of cedar, timber, and plank construction. These Indians had a stratified social system with hereditary chiefs and slaves. Native people enslaved other native people from coast to coast, but in Canada, slavery was most common in the Northwest coast. The records of Spanish, French, British, and American explorers, navigators, and fur traders give brutal accounts of slavery. Russian visitors wrote journals of how natives offered to sell them destitute native children. American teacher James G. Swan lived among the natives and he explained how the coastal tribes commonly held slaves. He wrote that the slaves, quote, were formally procured by making captives of the children or adults of any other tribe with whom they might be at variance. Children seem, seem in all cases to be preferred because they are cheaper and less likely to escape than adults. End of quote. Historian Olive Dickinson noted that war was the common source of slaves, but some were born into slavery. Slaves were powerless and could be put to death at the will of their masters. Addressing slavery in the Queen Charlotte Island region in the colonial area, one white commentator declared, quote, the Indians do not treat their slaves with as much kindness as the Indians in the lower country of the Oregon Territory treat theirs. When they kill their slaves, the loss of property is the only thing they regard, end of quote. Although there can be no way to measure the truthfulness of this claim, there was the perception among some commentators that enslaved natives on the Pacific coast experienced worse conditions than natives than native slaves elsewhere. Perhaps the better conditions of their communities allowed many natives to live in idleness at the expense of those enslaved. The Indians who lived in the Plateau cultural area, the smallest of the six cultural regions, relied on salmon. Living on the high plateau between the coast range and the Rocky Mountains, they did not farm, but instead traveled to good fishing areas. The South Central Interior British Columbia was their base. The climate was hot, dry, and in the, in the winter, very cold. 
the Plains Indians people lived in the open grasslands that encompass a large area that extended from Texas up to today's Prairie Provinces. The buffalo was the staple of existence for these people. There was no waste and the buffalo supplied food and material for teepees, clothes, shields, eating and drinking instruments, bowstring and fuel. They used buffalo dung for fires because there was no trees on the plains. The buffalo were large animals that could easily outrun humans. The natives devised an effective method of ambushing the herds and or forcing over a cliff. The natives hunted in small nomadic bands numbering less than 100 hunters. Before the arrival of the horse in the 1700s, the Plains Indians used dogs to transport their camps and supplies. In the vast Plains region, intertribal warfare was common. Pre-Columbian village sites were fortified with ditches and palisades. Work by archaeologists provide evidence of elaborate steps to fortify settlements that point to the real possibility of military conflict. Each tribe regarded their tribe as the people and viewed outsiders as enemies. Tribes fought over the choice hunting grounds over women and for recognition and status. Historian John Ewers writes that the history of intertribal warfare in this region seemed to show that it was much easier to start a war than it was to end one and that hostilities between neighboring tribes persisted from generation to generation. The Northeast Indians encompassed today's Atlantic provinces, Southern Quebec and the Great Lakes region. People in this area were the migratory Algonquins and the semi-nomadic Iroquois people. Within the Algonquin linguistic group was the Mi'kmaq located in the east. Some Algonquin groups farmed, yet hunting and fishing were essential for survival. The Algonquins, sorry, the Iroquois depended much more on, on farming for survival, growing corn and beans. In the Southern Ontario region, there were approximately 120 frost-free days. Men fell trees by first charring the base of the tree trunks and using crude stone axes to finish the job. To keep enemy tribes out, Villages were stockaded and could house as many as 1,500 people. An individual longhouse housed from, 30, from 10 to 30 families. Indians held religious beliefs that helped them make sense of their world. They believed in the unseen world of spirits that guided their lives. Spiritual advisors and shamans were particularly skilled in assessing the, the powers of the unseen world. Each member of the community, however, had the potential to acquire spiritual power. The people, animals, and their land were connected. The people themselves depended on nature and thus had a contractual or symbiotic relationship with the forces of nature. Between the natives and animals, there was a relationship of mutual courtesy. For example, a hunter demonstrated respect for the animal he killed by voicing a prayer, or else the animal spirit would retaliate and cause his arrows to miss future prey or cause other animals to flee the hunting areas. Individual natives held personal property, but the concept of private property, as we understand it, was a strange idea. The viewpoint of possessive individualism, which values individual ownership of material goods, was less common. Owning a piece of land would be as strange as if we today owned our own piece of air. It is important to say more about the topic of native wars. Scholars have uncovered much evidence of intertribal warfare, but a common myth in today's popular culture is that native groups more or less experience a life of harmony with each other.
it is difficult to find evidence of close and amicable relations between native groups, at least in the pre-Columbian era. Native peoples lack a police force or judiciary to enforce justice. When there were murders, the relatives of the victim were expected to avenge the murder by killing the suspected killer or someone re related to the killer. In return, families of the killer were honor bound to protect the killer. The result of this dilemma could be a prolonged blood feud. Avenging murders could also lead to intertribal wars. As mentioned earlier about the Plains Indians, conflict between different groups could, could persist for long periods of time. Emotions ran high, for example, in the Northeast when there was loss of life in a skirmish between Hur Hur Hurons and Iroquois, captives could be taken back to the enemy village where they were beaten, sometimes bitten, and forced to run naked through a gauntlet of angry villagers. If one was brave, they might be adopted into the village. Those who did not measure up received more torture. Ripping out hair, pulling off fingernails, burning flesh, and breaking bones were brutal actions that both female and male natives faced. Sometimes the villagers ate bits of the captive's flesh in a sacrificial rite designed to gain the victim's wisdom and strength. Captured nat natives typically awaited the torture with, quote, majestic stoicism. This cycle repeated itself. The arrival of the Europeans and the emergence of the fur trade resulted in further hostility. The Mohawks, located in western New York, bought guns from Dutch traders with furs they had seized from neighboring tribes. The Hurons in southern Ontario acquired guns from the French. When the Europeans arrived in the New World, they discovered both friendly and hostile Indians. The native people also saw both the good and bad in the Europeans. Two schools of historical interpretation on European Indian contact are cultural relativism and rationalism. Cultural relativists or romanticists focus on the beliefs of specific cultures that they argue that, and they argue that cultural patterns determine human behavior, whereas the rationalist approach sees human behavior as shaped mainly by a calculations of individual self-interest that are uniform from one culture to another. In other words, the rationalist school stresses the, the universality of human nature and maintains that through the exercise of reason, human groups at the same general level of development will respond in a similar way to the same kind of challenges. Scholars in both camps must deal with the problem that only a small corpus of documents provide eyewitness accounts of contact in the 16th century. Many encounters between Indians and Europeans were unrecorded. It is clear, however, that it was a strange experience for Native Americans when they saw the bearded, white-skinned Europeans who arrived in huge boats and who possessed metal goods, bright clothes, and thundering weapons. Indian folk traditions reveal that some natives initially viewed European ships as floating islands controlled by supernatural spirits. The ship's sails were white clouds that could discharge lightning and thunder, the latter referring to the ship's thunderous cannons. Believing that the Europeans had supernatural power, there was cases of Indians bringing their sick to European posts for healing. Anthropologist Bruce Trigger notes that Europeans took advantage of their so-called supernatural powers. Quote, sometimes the deaths of early European explorers and settlers were concealed in the hope that Indians might continue to believe they were immortal, end of quote. Many natives viewed the early missionaries as shamans. However, Jesuits in today's Ontario became sorcerers or malevolent spirits in the eyes of some Europe of some Hurons 
who linked the increase of deadly diseases to the Jesuits. In time, most ordinary French men who traded and lived with Indian families were seen as regular human beings without any special power. In fact, due to their difficulty in learning native languages and their lack of competent fishing and hunting skills, they were viewed as slow-witted. Natives who initially reacted to European primarily on the basis of their traditional religious beliefs come to regard Europeans as human beings with whom, while continuing to take account of their special customs and sensibilities, they could do business as they did with another foreign group. According to Bruce Trigger, this development offers support for a rationalist perspective for understanding Native life. To conclude, these six cultural regions represent an effective method to categorize the experience of Canadian Natives. Climate, land, and the availability of game dictated how Native groups adapted and survived during the Stone Age. There was significant diversity of Native cultures, but like the Europeans who eventually encroach on their way of life, they could not escape the sins of conquest, bloodshed, bloodshed, and war. Thank you.